the university community is well represented and is particularly welcome today. When Professor the Honorable Ralston Milton Nettleford, known to all as Rex, died in 2010, his passing left an immense void, not only in Jamaica, but the wider Caribbean and beyond. Rex impressed everyone as a man of balance. He numbered political friends on both sides of Gordon House. In the wider scope of the Caribbean, many political leaders benefited from his tutelage and influence at UWI. He is also revered for his vital contributions to the trade union movement, primarily through the Trade Union Education Institute. Led by the then Vice Chancellor, Professor Nigel Harris, a partnership was created between the university, the NDTC, and the Nettleford family to establish the Rex Nettleford Foundation in order to ensure that his tremendous life and legacy would live in perpetuity. They are watching on stream as so many others who we welcome to this presentation. Central to the mission of the foundation is support for scholars and programs that promote the strengthening of West Indian society in the areas of social and cultural development through research, community service, and intellectual excellence. It seeks to produce young leaders who grasp the importance of public service based on integrity and protecting the weak and vulnerable and who will use their energies and talents for the betterment and upliftment of humankind. Since its establishment, the foundation has provided scholarships and bursaries to students who exhibit the promise of Rex Nettleford's foundation. To date, Scholarships have been awarded to academically outstanding Cornwall College students who have enrolled in an institution of higher learning and who are involved in extracurricular activities and also in community service. These students are selected by Cornwall College. The Foundation has encouraged academically outstanding Rex Nettleford Hall students to get involved in extracurricular activities as well as community service. So too, outstanding dance students at Edna Manley School of the Visual and Performing Arts. We insisted that students should be invited and included in this presentation, and I am very delighted to see so many of them here with us today. <laughs> Rex Nettleford, in his search to extend the reach of Jamaican culture, has made the NDTC a towering monument which accords with his ide ideals of telling our own stories and magnifying the diversity of the Jamaican identity. 
Each year, the foundation hosts Remembering Rex, a performance of the National Dance Theatre Company and the University Singers in celebration of the life and legacy of Professor Nettleford. One such will be staged next Wednesday, and we invite your patronage as it will help to fund the work of the foundation. Today is the 90th birthday for the king himself. So, for the committee for the foundation, which I have the honor to chair, has embarked on a new trajectory. In this year of the university's Diamond Jubilee, we are making a momentous leap forward by the inauguration of a distinguished lecture series, which must not merely be the most prestigious throughout the Caribbean, but universally and in today's parlance, top ranking. <laughs> Commencing this 90th Earth Landing of Rex, the Foundation will host an annual Distinguished Rex Nettleford Lecture Series in keeping with the concept of, quote, inward stretch, outward reach, unquote a theme expounded in one of his later works, which explored the need to move our understanding of ourselves as a Caribbean people to a global level. The annual lecture will be held on his birthday on a different university campus each year. And I believe Professor Weber the Mona campus is going to be insisting on getting its own. <laughs> We're doing so as Professor Nettleford's considerable gifts and wise counsel were shared with many heads of government, with UNESCO and other international institutions, with a number of corporate entities and institutions of higher learning, both regionally and internationally. It was obviously appropriate that the inaugural lecture be held here at the UWI regional headquarters as a signature event in a week of celebrating Rex during the university's year-long celebrations of its Diamond Jubilee 75th anniversary. Given the expansive, preeminent engagement of Rex in culture, the arts, education, politics, global affairs, and trade unionism, our advisory board found it difficult to select the one area with which we should begin. So we decided instead to find a scholar with an equally expansive intellectual span and leave that decision of the choice of subject to our inaugural lecturer. Having done so, we unanimously and instantly invited another distinguished graduate of our own university, Professor the Honorable Dr. Orlando Patterson, to deliver the inaugural lecture. Despite his heavy lecture obligations at Harvard and resulting tight travel schedule, we are pleased 
that he readily consented, I am told no longer to use the imagery of cricket, but instead to resort to athletics <laughs> and to give us a good start out of the blocks. <laughs> he will, of course, be properly presented by the Vice Chancellor himself. The topic he has selected is both audacious and provocative. The past has not passed. The heritage of slavery and genocide in Jamaica. I would describe it as vintage Rex Milton. The foundation in need of a sponsor chose the National Commercial Bank, which responded wisely and favorably <laughs> in view of the unique contribution which Rex Netterford rendered as a director of the board for several years during an in initial period in its restoration and growth. It would not be a stretch to state that we are living in a Jamaica to whose standing in the world of today, Rex Nettleford has contributed so much, certainly from the cultural, artistic, and intellectual perspective. Today, we recognize and acknowledge both the diverse scope and the reach of his vision. Today we salute his drive to see that vision to fruition and the continuing significance of his ideas in all spheres where he was engaged. It is that which impels an audience of this size and complexity and magnitude to take a Friday afternoon to be present with us today. The event will proceed without any further intervention by me as chair of these proceedings. It is my great pleasure on behalf of the foundation to welcome one and all as we partake in the feast which we are shortly to enjoy. Thank you. Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, Mrs. Kerry Ann Henry, Ballet Mistress for the National Dance Theatre <laughs> Company Performance, Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor for the University of the West Indies, the Honorable Orlando Patterson, the inaugural Rex Nettleford Distinguished Lecture Professor, Mr. Milton Samuda, Chairman of the National Dance Theatre Company of Jamaica, Distinguished guests, everyone, good afternoon. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to stand before you today to pay tribute to a true Jamaican hero, the late professor, the Honorable Rex, Ralston Rex Milton Nettleford OM. 
A true Renaissance man, he was known for his exceptional talents across multiple fields. He was an academic, political analyst, historian, dancer, and a cultural ambassador for Jamaica. He also served as a director of the National Commercial Bank Jamaica Limited, which as the most honorable PJ Patterson mentioned just now, responded wisely and favorably. <laughs> And he was also vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, and he dedicated his, in, his entire life to the study of Jamaica's history, culture, and society. Professor Nettleford's passion for the arts led him to become a co-founder for the National Dance Theatre Company, NDTC, in 1962, and served as its artistic director until his death in 2010. Under Nettlesford's leadership, the company became known for its innovative approach to Caribbean dance and its fusion of traditional and contemporary styles. His legacy continues to live on today through the NDTC and its continued success. Professor Nettlesford's work was groundbreaking and had a significant impact on our understanding of Jamaica and the Caribbean region. He was a passionate advocate for the study of Caribbean history and culture, and believed that understanding one's own culture was essential to understanding the world at large. He was also a strong voice for social justice, using his platform to call attention to the issues of poverty, inequality, and discrimination that continue to plague our society. His contributions to education were equally impressive. As the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, he worked tirelessly to improve the quality of education and research in the region. He also established the Mona Campus of the University of the West Indies as a, cent as a center for Caribbean studies, providing a platform for scholars to research and share their findings on the region's history and culture. The theme for today's inaugural Rex Nettleford Distinguished Lecture is The Past Has Not Passed, The Heritage of Slavery and Genocide in Jamaica. The theme is fitting based on the legacy of Professor Nettleford. Our beautiful country has a rich and diverse history and innovative and resilient people. However, the heritage of slavery should never be denied or forgotten. As a quote by George Santanier says, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. It is essential for us to recognize and learn about this turbulent period in our nation's history to fully understand the present and strive for a better future. By facing our past, we can work towards creating a more inclusive and equitable society for all. Professor Nettleford's legacy continues to inspire and guide us today. His work has helped to deepen our understanding of Jamaica's history and culture, and has also contributed to the development of a broader Caribbean identity. He has inspired many young scholars to continue his work and to explore the rich history and culture of the Caribbean region. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Nettleford was a true visionary and we're grateful for his contributions and will continue to carry his legacy in our own work. We should all strive to be as committed and passionate in our endeavors as Prof. Nettleford was in his. Let us remember him and his legacy always. I thank you. <laughs>
the Westmoreland of Usain Bolt. <laughs> no? Eh? We, we, because we, we, we assume that it, the, the Trelawney Westmoreland is, is like one. <laughs> it's, it's one complex. So that way, I, that way I can also include, that way I can also include P.J. Patterson, who we know is from Hanover, but represented Westmoreland. So that I can also get Westmoreland there as, 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 as well. Graduate of the UWI and the London School of Economics. One of the world's finest scholars, intellectuals, and he has an entourage of awards and honors to prove it. A celebrated son of global academia and the grassroots from whence he came. An old friend, an old trusted friend and mentor. Thirty-one years ago, I was invited to introduce him to deliver the Elsa Gavaya Memorial Lecture at the Cavill campus. And this is the introduction I made 31 years ago. I was very tempted to read it because it's still very relevant. But this was 31 years ago, so I put this aside and speak to phase two of this introduction. Professor Patterson was speaking on the subject then, capitalism and colonial slavery and the rise of modern freedom. He had just won the very prestigious United States National Book Award for his latest book, Freedom in the Making of Western Culture. This was it. And this is the first edition, by the way. But critically, from a personal perspective, eight years prior, I had traveled to Bellagio, the Rockefeller Center in the Italian Alps, to meet Professor Patterson. Harvard University was organizing this symposium and had invited the elite scholars of the world to opine on the subject. And Orlando was one of the major presenters. In the budget, the funding of that conference, there was a line item which said, funding for a junior scholar. That was me. <laughs> I was a rookie in the history department here at Mona and I'm speaking about 1983. And under that line item, I got a ticket to go to Bellagio, motivated by the need to meet Orlando for the first time. He had already established himself as the leading scholar in Caribbean history, uh, the global concepts of ideas about justice and freedom, I had not yet written a book, but how can I not take this opportunity to go to meet Orlando and introduce myself? And we have been good friends since then. I embraced him, he embraced me, and Orlando, I thank you for that mentoring over the decades. Undoubtedly, 
we are in the company of an intellectual genius. The product in many ways of C.L.R. James, who had impacted his intellectual development. We know that he's a graduate of our university in 1962 and went on a quick time to complete his PhD at the London School of Economics. But while he was collecting his doctorate at such a very young age, he was also receiving a very important award, the same 1965, at the Festival of Negro Arts in Senegal. He received the best book award for that extraordinary novel, The Children of Syphysis. 1983, the US-based Chronicle for Higher Education says of Professor Patterson, he has managed a rare intellectual achievement, receiving distinguished awards in more than one discipline, specifically in the field of political science and sociology. The Chronicle was making reference to the fact that Professor Patterson had won simultaneously the awards from the American Political Science Association as well as the American Sociological Association simultaneously for his work. His academic productivity has never ended. His latest seminal work, 2019, The Confounding Island, Jamaica and the Postcolonial Predicament, continues to stir conversation in Jamaica and beyond. In addition to these multiple academic awards, he has also received prestigious recognition from his nation, Jamaica. The Gold Musgrave Medal in 2015 and the Order of Merit, Jamaica's third highest honor in 2020. His latest service to the nation and to academia was in leading a commission on the educational system of Jamaica that has found expression in what is now known as the Patterson Report. And we are here on the cusp of discussions about what will be done with the Patterson's Report which really is an extraordinary blueprint for the transformation of Jamaica's educational system. The inaugural Rex Netterford Distinguished Lecture is therefore placed in the finest hands. And I am sure, as you all are, that somewhere above Rex is having a wonderful dance. <laughs> I'm sure there's a pokemonia at work somewhere and this afternoon, our professor will lecture on the title, The Past Has Not Passed, The Heritage of Slavery and Genocide in Jamaica. The genocide aspect is entirely worthy of great exposition at this time because we know that the British imported 1.3 million Africans into Jamaica in chains. 1.3 million imported in chains. And at emancipation, only 300,000 remain. 300,000 from 1.3 million. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor the Honorable Orlando Patterson. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my friend. I'm also, okay, in the hands of our technicians here, is it working now, sir? Fantastic. Okay, we did it. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, the most 
Honorable uh, P.J. Patterson, whom I've known from our undergraduate days here in this great institution. It's a couple of years beyond me, and then we both went up to LSE together. Um, Sir Hilary Beckles and Lady, Be Lady Beckles. And I'm told it's a bit okay to say all protocols observed. <laughs> I want very much to get into the topic I want to discuss today, an extraordinary important one. I think you'll all agree. But before that, let me say I'm deeply honored to deliver the inaugural lecture in commemoration of the Honorable Ralston Milton Rex Nettleford. He was a great Jamaican who through his thoughts, and writings, his actions, his achievements, and simply by example, certainly in my case, I remember the example was walking around the campus and seeing this very athletic man and um, wondering who is that? And uh, being told, even then, we're going back 60 years now, uh, who he was and being very impressed. Um, he greatly influenced his people and his culture. For me, Rex was one of the role models that inf influenced me as a young student, scholar here at U UE, UC then. What most influenced me was the fact that Rex was the quintessential scholar, public intellectual. I've followed that course in my own life. Rex was a model in another way, though, I want to emphasize, for me, certainly. He was the quintessential Renaissance man. A scholar was also, of course, a wonderful dancer and choreographer, a social and cultural critic, a distinguished administrator rising to the leadership of his university, the vice chancellor. Rex, for me, belongs to a trilogy of great West Indians, a Renaissance man who set the model for what I was um, to attempt to achieve and profoundly influenced me. Who are the three? Who are the other two? Sailor James, the great scholar who, when I arrived in London from UWE, I, myself, Norman Gervin, and Walter Rodney, we never figured out how CLR knew we were there. We were just ordinary students or where we lived, but we were ordered to come to the home of the great man every Friday evening for indoctrination in the true path. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what that path was, but we went and we literally sat at his feet, partly because this is the only place to sit in his little apartment. But he was one of the trilogy. The other, and of course, it greatly influenced me. I'm now writing a book on him. The other, of course, was Eric Williams. Again, another great Renaissance man, another great scholar whose work, by the way, I can tell you, is still sort of raising issues and leading to all kind of contention uh, over half a century since, well, what am I talking, over 60 years since his publication, but who was also a statesman. These three, I, I always sort of put them together Sailor, who's written book in Greek culture, on uh, American literature, and of course the Afro, uh, the, on the, um, the, the African uh, movement, uh, and um, and of course slavery, and, um, and and Williams, Nettleford belongs to that company. As a Renaissance man, the person I used to see here, whose writings were so powerful in influencing how we think about our own culture. Mirror, mirror, it's very important exploration, the whole problem of color, beauty, and culture in Jamaica, um, his work with the trade union movement. But the fact that someone who works in something so intensely intellectual 
and practical, was also a great, beautiful aesthetician, a dancer. That, that combination, I don't know of anywhere else in the world uh, where you can find a scholar who combined those two. And that greatly impressed me. So I have, uh, I've always strive for that, to be a public intellectual. And for eight years, special advisor to Michael Manley. And I just, one of the pleasant experiences of my life that um, when I was asked to meet with the present prime minister, <laughs> the first question he, said, he asked me, or rather the first thing he said to me is, you know, you started, when did you start with Manley? I said, 72. He said, you know, that was the year I was born. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that I see no difference uh, in shifting from my academic work, my intellectual work, to my public intellectual work. And I'm still doing it. And for that, I thank the models before me, chief among them being Rex. So today I'm going to discuss a topic which was dear to his heart. I was speaking to the Honorable P.J. Patterson earlier about a subject which greatly animated him and which was of great, great concern, um, the question of um, whether we should do away with Emancipation Day and replace it with independence. Now, I was immediately corrected by uh, PJ, if I might, uh, that that was a struggle which she was involved with very much initiated. But I recall, in fact, because I was asked to deliver a lecture way back around that time, uh, that Rex was very, very concerned too. In fact, he was made chairman of the commission to consider this by the Honorable P.J. Patterson. Rex was very concerned and very took the side very strongly that we have to keep that Emancipation Day celebration. And he did so not to celebrate the British. You know, Eric Williams, my other hero, <laughs> once said, the British talk about how they emancipated the slaves so much that you'd think they invented slavery just to be able to say they <laughs> abolished it. <laughs> no, uh, Rex's concern wasn't with celebrating emancipation as such, but the commemoration of the suffering of um, the slaves, of their survival, of what they achieved in um, in, 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 do, in during the 133 years of their existence. Ah, this works, wonderful, wonderful. So today I want to address that subject, okay? Guys think it's still relevant. And it's, um, I am very much involved with it because as some of you may know, I began my career working on slavery in Jamaica. I think the first major modern study of slavery in Jamaica um, went on to other things, slavery around the world, freedom and so on, but I've come back to it in the, uh, preparing for the second edition of the Sociology of Slavery. And the problem I want to address, especially in light of the debate we're now having, more than the debate, the movement led by Caribbean um, intellectual and political leaders for reparation and um, central to that for recognition of the crime against humanity that was slavery. Um, I want to begin by comparing slavery and genocide. I look at it in a serious way, um, the physical and cultural dimensions. I want to compare US and Jamaican slavery um, because it will, um, is a necessary background to making the point I want to make today uh, that slavery in Jamaica was genocide. I want to just not make the point, I want to quantify it. Um, and I want to, if I have the time, want to say something about the consequences of slavery today. Thank you, sir. Um, 
There's growing interest, of course, in the subject of genocide, especially in the United States. Um, there's an academic uh, resurgence in the subject, many courses on genocide now. Uh, the, the study of um, slavery itself is also going through uh, a period of tremendous growth. And um, a topic which <laughs> Americans are now discovering, but which we all knew about even as undergraduates or half a century ago from the work of Eric Williams, slavery and capitalism. People like Sven Beckert and so on from Harvard have revived the subject. In fact, it is a center of controversy because the 1619 Project, which the New York Times sort of um, promoted, has caused huge controversy in America. But it certainly has put brought to the fore the question of slavery and what it meant. My own university has recognized the role of slavery in funding its um, institution and also the role of slaves within it. And um, I am happy to say, I'm proud to say, after a review of um, the record, has um, put aside $130 million for the commemoration of slavery. Uh, in, uh, in Harvard. Um, and it goes beyond academic studies. Uh, museums uh, all over uh, America and um, genocide commissions and so on. Uh, so I, um, the subject is very much finally, um, it's gone beyond academia, it's very much part of um, the um, general debate. Now, I am proud to say that my book, Slavery and Social Death, has played a little role in the, the, these debates. Many of the major studies of um, genocide have not just referred to, but incorporated um, the idea, the central idea of slavery and social death, which, let me say, began with my study of slavery in Jamaica. Uh, I'm going to run you through a few of these major studies which have influenced genocide studies, which have drawn on the idea of slavery as social death. But social death, by social death, which began, as I said, with my study of slavery in Jamaica, although I developed the concept uh, a few years later in my broader comparative study of slavery across the world in which I tried to figure out what is the nature of slavery. Um, what does it hold in common, the experience of slaves in Jamaica with the experience of Greek or Scythian uh, slaves in Rome in the second century BC? Um, and I came up with uh, the idea of slavery as a form of social death, which involves total domination of one person by another, secondly, the idea of natal alienation, which is the idea that the slave does not belong. The slave is someone who's been uprooted, deracinated from their homeland, their native community, and reinserted in a new situation in which they do not belong to that society because they belong to the owner. And the idea of the slave as not belonging is one which lingers. Um, the, and it's a very important idea, I think, and, um, the, uh, because it had not been sufficiently emphasized in previous studies, which had emphasized more the idea of slavery as property, which I argued it was a primarily uh, Roman uh, conception of slavery, and of course the degradation ultimate slavery was the ultimate state of degradation, person without honor. Um, but the important thing to understand, and it's important that we do, what this meant beyond these broader concepts. And I've, um, in the introduction to the second edition of Slavery and Social Death, I um, dug deeply into you know, what the implication was based on what modern psychological studies have um, offered us in terms of what it is that constitutes, what defines, 
oneself as a human being. And um, the work of Susan Fisk, a great, a wonderful uh, psychologist at Princeton, was for me uh, central. The idea here, that she argues, that there are five fundamental things that define our humanity from a psychological point of view. The most important of these is belonging. We all want to have some sense of belonging to a particular society, a particular group. It is critical for our existence. Okay. Um, the, the need to understand and make sense of our environment. We'd be able to sort of figure out what is it? The need to control, to have some control and some competence over the outcomes of our lives. The need to view ourselves as worthy or improvable. And to feel good about ourselves. And the need to trust others, to be able to trust. To view the world as a place that facilitates group life, attachment, interdependence, and we can trust others. Now, the thing about slavery is that it was a, an assault on every single one of these basic human needs. Everyone. And the evidence on that is just incontrovertible. But the need to belong, the fact that this is the idea of natal alienation, that you did not belong to your community. You're the permanent outsider. As the, as the Southerners said, long after slavery, of blacks, that they were the domestic enemy. They have no place in that society. And that idea lingers. Obviously, they need to make sense. How do you make sense of your environment when every morning you get up? You know, you do not belong to yourself, that you'll be ordered to work for another. Not just today, not just tomorrow, not just to the end of your life, but also for the lives of your children and your children's children. What does that do? Just imagine, just use your imagination getting up each day and knowing that. Having control over yourself. I want to emphasize too, of these five, one that is often neglected, trust, trust. The need to trust others. This is going to have great implications later on. Right up to this very day. Okay? Now, genocide, as I said, has um, gone through many studies, but um, the, it, the recognition of genocide as a crime against humanity is one which sort of post-World War II um, development. And um, sort of Lemkin, the Raphael Lemkin, the um, Jewish uh, lawyer, was the first to develop, to use the term uh, genocide as the destruction of a nation or an ethnic group. Okay, just in 1944 is when the term was first used. Uh, that his work and the work of others, Eleanor Roosevelt and others, are uh, coming out of the horrors of the Second World War, the clear you know, sort of evidence of the malign evil of uh, the Germans in the extermination of uh, more than half the Jewish population, uh, led world leaders to take it this seriously. Uh, culminating in the 1948 United Nations um, Declaration on um, the Nature of Genocide. And um, the, um, I'm going to, um, let me, I'm not quite sure why, I don't think I can read, but uh, essentially the killing of, it has two dimensions, uh, a mental element and a physical element. The, the, the physical element is the sort of 
deliberate killing of, um, of people, of belonging to a particular group. Okay, that's the critical factor. The, sorry. The deliberate killing of a particular group of people. The mental element is that of intent. The intention to do so. Now this is very important for the argument I'm going to develop later on. Having intention of killing a particular group because, because of the group to which they belong. Now, almost all the clauses have been contested. <laughs> this, is, this is the nature of intellectuals to do that. Um, uh, Sartre, for example, um, had a famous blast against the definition because he argued that there's too great an emphasis on intent. Um, and he is referring, say, to the <coughs> Vietnam War. His argument was that um, the killing of people, whether you intend to kill them as a people or not, constitutes genocide. And the murder, he claims, the killing of hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese, um, he felt constituted genocide. Uh, Americans insisted that it was not. This is war. The idea here is that you have masculines in all periods of history. And the, the, what happened with the napalm bombing of the Vietnamese, which we all agree was cruel, was wicked, and so on, but it wasn't genocide because there wasn't the intent to destroy a particular group. It was just an accident of war. And Sartre was very, very vehemently opposed to that. And the argument it, and continues. It's also argued that um, it's a, the definition excluded political groups. So a lot of political, a lot of groups are being exterminated because of their politics. Stalin, star, uh, whether deliberate or not, the starvation of millions of peasants in Stalin's Russia in his agricultural policy was often cited. But you can think of many other situations of um, political savagery not Vietnam today. Is that genocide? Um, they, there's another important element, and these points are important in terms of the argument I'm going to make about genocide in Jamaica, is that preventing people from having kids, from reproducing, amounts to a form of genocide. Bear that in mind. It's very important to my argument, OK? Um, the question of quantity, how many you have to be killed, because as I said wars have been going on from the beginning of mankind. Um, do you, does, it, does it have to be in the millions? Does it have to be um, one million, 100,000, 20, 10? Can you have genocide if you only kill 10 people? And so on. It's a quant problem of quantification. And most important of all, question of cultural genocide. Um, and that became a major um, element in the debate. And it's going to be an important one in my argument today. Um, the concept of ethnocide is important. I want to introduce you to it if you've not heard it before. OK? Um, Lemkin was also the person who coined the term, about the same time that he coined the term the genocide. Um, and um, he didn't see that as um, really making a difference. Well, he thought ethnocide and genocide went together. Um, there's a long debate about this uh, in the 1948 discussions. And several countries opposed the idea of ethnocide, that is, of cultural murder of the decimation of a people's traditions. And um, the U I think the US and several other countries argued strongly against. So it was removed, uh, even though Lemkin has tried very hard to include it as important. It was removed from the original formal definitions. It's, it's developed again. It's become important. And it's in the news very much now, especially uh, with respect to the treatment of uh, Native Americans in the US and in Canada. And just recently, uh, the Pope, in fact, uh, the present Pope has recognized the genocide 
sorry, the treatment of the culture of the Indians, moving them forcefully from their families and reindoctrinating them to become Euro Canadians and Euro American, as he said, it's a form of genocide. So he's taken a side on this, that ethnocide amongst genocide. So it's an important point to remember um, uh, in, in this debate. Now, the person I want to pay special attention to is a brilliant philosopher of genocide by the name of Claudia Card. Now, I call attention to her not simply because she used my concept of social death as central to her definition of genocide, but because it's a pretty smart idea. Um, and, um, so, so, basically, um, Claudia Card's argument is that we need a way of getting around the fact that um, genocide is not just killing of people. It's called the Sams all the time. Sams in every war and so on. And um, she argues that the, um, the killing, the destruction of a people's way of life, what makes life meaningful to them, um, is an important component. She used my idea of social death in developing this um, notion. And um, she, um, uh, her work has been extremely influential. Uh, and with it, the sort of the idea of social death as a, as, as, as a critical component of what constitutes genocide. I've been intrigued by that debate. It's continued, um, uh, as I said, um, in, in, in many areas, including, as I mentioned earlier, the Pope. Um, and um, the, um, the idea um, has sort of influenced several major recent studies. Uh, the study of um, the Jewish life in Nazi Germany, um, it's, um, in which one argument is that the period between about 1935 and 1940 um, was felt to be uh, a period of social death in which the Jewish culture was being assaulted. But the Jews at that time were not being mass killed. In fact, they were being exploited and used their labor and so on. So um, the idea is that after um, the, the actual killing, which began um, in the, after the 40s, constitutes genocide as opposed to ethnocide or social death in the earlier one. Anyway, the central idea here is that people have tried to use the concept of social death to sort of incorporate the notion of um, ethnocide in, um, in, in um, the notion of what constitutes genocide. Another important recent development, which you may not have heard of, another form of mass extermination, which I teach myself. In fact, I teach it now in the course I'm teaching at Harvard on um, modern day slavery and um, servitude is um, gender side. Now what's that? Uh, another crime against humanity, which is the selective killing of people because of their gender. Now you say, what on earth is that? Well, um, the um, victims are usually girls, occasionally boys are involved, but it's primarily a killing of women. Um, now, it's a modern development, it's a post-1980s development in particular, because of a new technological development, fair, relatively new. The fact that we can identify the gender of the fetus. Uh, now, all over the world from time immemorial, there's a bias in favor of boys. People wanted to have boys instead of girls. Once that discovery was made, you can imagine what the result was. Uh, people began to ask their gynecologists, is it a boy or is it a girl? And if it's a girl, she's aborted. Now, that has had a devastating effect. There, it's possible to estimate how many women 
have been exterminated. Many potential women have been exterminated for the simple reason that we have a constant, a, 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 a human constant, which is we know that in nature, um, you know, there's a certain ratio of equality, basically. A few more boys are born than girls, but by the end of the first year, I mean, girl, women who have stronger survival potential, uh, more boys die. So by the end of the six months to a year, the, the sexes are equal in nature. Now, if you know that, you can then make a simple calculation. If you start seeing sex ratios of 110 boys to 100 girls, that shouldn't happen. Something is going on. And we've been able to use that, uh, starting with the work of Amartya Sen, the economist and so on, to calculate just how many girls have been exterminated, have been killed. The estimate, the, the economist, so the magazine which tends to be very skeptical of um, newfangled ideas, um, it gives an estimate of 100 million women. There are, and that's a conservative estimate. The most latest estimate is that there are something approaching 150 million women girls should be in the world who are not. And that's gender side. That's a form of you know, like genocide. Now that point is very important, very important, again, for the argument I want to make later, because it suggests that preventing birth, preventing the reproduction of a particular group, whether it's women or girls, or blacks or Native Americans, constitutes genocide. Remember that. And that's not fully accepted in the literature. Um, now, a lot of um, studies have compared slavery and genocide. And um, the, uh, what it has in common, how they differ. Um, one important distinction often made um, is um, that the slaveholder wants to preserve the bodies of the slave. That's, what, that's the whole point. They need their bodies to work um, and have no interest in deliberately killing them, exterminating them. Okay, That was often seen as fundamental. Um, and um, it, it's um, so while it's brutal and so on, the treatment, uh, there's a difference between what was going on in Jamaica and in the U.S. South in the 18th century and what was going on in uh, the Armenian genocide or the Jewish genocide in that the, um, there was an attempt not just, um, there was an attempt to exterminate the particular group because they didn't have any use for them otherwise. Um, the, uh, the book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, which is a bestseller on, um, on the subject uh, a few years ago, um, uh, used that idea and used my idea of social death, in fact, by arguing that, indeed, the profound difference between the killing of Jews in uh, Hitler's Germany and, um, and slavery, he said. Um, the, um, the book, it's got a classic study uh, between dignity and despair, which is a study of Jewish life in Germany between 1930 and 1945. I also use the idea of um, social death, as I mentioned earlier, to describe the earlier period as this thing, which is uh, more akin to ethnocide, as this thing from the later period of extermination, which is aiming at the bodies, uh, exterminating the bodies. Others, um, scholars have um, entered the debate, um, the, um, the uh, arguing, one side or the other, uh, that um, whether, whether slavery amounted to um, uh, genocide or not. Um, some people are arguing that it involves genocide in that ethnocide has got to be seen as a component, and they draw on Claudia Card. 
others distinguish between the two. I won't sort of bore you with the details. One has to be careful, however, not to take a too monolithic view of slavery in the Americans, which several of these studies have done. And uh, there's significant variation in the kinds of slavery which existed in the Americas, an important point I wish to draw attention to, and also variation within particular uh, slave societies. Uh, difference in residence patterns and cultures, the slaveholders, some in which, like the US slaveholders, lived there, others like Jamaica, in which they got the hell out of there as soon as they made their fortune. Uh, differences in provisioning slaves, uh, differences in manumission rates, where you had fairly high manumission rates in some Latin American countries, very low in others, such as the US. Uh, differences in opportunities to revolt and so on, marinage and what have you. Um, so one has to take account of that, and in fact, I have exploited those differences between um, slave societies in my argument for genocide in Jamaica. Also, as I will point out later on, variations within slave society can be exploited to indicate the consequences of um, slavery, which I'll have um, a little to say about later on. So, let me um, move to what I think is a very important, one of the most important um, if you like, uh, distinctions between slave societies and to compare two of the major slave societies, which I'm going to use to make my argument for genocide in Jamaica. Uh, the two paradigmatic systems, in fact, I'd say, um, is the US, the US, the US South, and Jamaica. They're both plantation systems, but very different, very different. Different ownership patterns. Typically in Jamaica, the average slave um, plantation had a significant, uh, over 120 on average. Um, in the US, the typical ownership pattern was very different. It's about, the average of about 10 slaves. Uh, in the US, the majority of people not just in America in general, but even within the slave South, were free people, as opposed to Jamaica, where the vast majority of the population were slaves. Um, another important difference is that the majority of the whites in the South were not slaveholders or directly involved with the slave system. Um, the, um, you had to profound differences in the residence of the slaveholder class, which tended to be in the US where they were developing a new kind of um, society, which they're very proud, as opposed to the absenteeism in Jamaica. Another difference, it's an important one for my argument, is the vast wealth and the vast difference, and this is going to come as a surprise to you, because today you think of America as the land of the rich, and Jamaica is a poor country. Huh? In, Jama in the 18th century, Jamaican whites were 30, the, the income of Jamaican whites is 35 times higher than the per capita income of the average American white person. Think about that. Think about that. It's based on sort of very good work by a couple of eco um, econ economic historians. 35 times richer, the average white person in Jamaica, than the average white person in the US. It's hard to believe that now, but it gives you an idea of the vast differences uh, in the 18th century and the enormous wealth being generated in Jamaica. Um, and of course, the US was a fairly stable system. Relatively few slave revolts. You've heard of the famous ones. Jamaica, I defined as the near Hobbesian state of nature. It was hell. It was hell. It was hell for everybody. 
It was hell for the slaves, but many of the whites thought it was hell too. But you know, they were prepared to put up with it if they could make their fortune and get the hell out of there as soon as they could. But um, uh, 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 several historians have shown uh, it was a risk which didn't work for many of them. Their chances of dying were 30% uh, within a couple of years. It was a death, death trap. Um, so um, a very diff two very different kinds of societies. And we want to compare the two of them because it's a critical in making my argument about genocide in Jamaica. Now for slaves, what do these two systems mean? One based on sugar, one based on cotton. In simplest terms, to get back to my earlier argument, in Jamaica, well, both had social death, for the reasons I explained earlier. Um, but in Jamaica, the system amounted to not just ethnocide, but ethnocide and genocide. Um, ethnogenocide. In America, it was primarily ethnocide. Remember that. It meant physical extermination for blacks in Jamaica. Um, it did not in the United States. And we can show that. And I want to walk you through um, the data to support that. The interesting thing about the study of slavery when I did it many years ago, over 60 years ago and today, is that there have been a fantastic increase in quantification of um, the slave population. Thanks to the work of many sort of really sort of um, uh, extremely talented um, economic and social historian. Um, Basically, got a long story short, the Jamaican planters mercilessly pursued a policy of demographic, a demographic strategy, which was very different from the demographic strategy pursued in the United States. The demographic strategy used by the Jamaican slave masters, slave owners, slaveholders, is, look, you gotta calculate between whether you should try to rear your slave, bring them up, breed them, or uh, which involve costs. What are they called? Lots of costs. The cost of losing the labor of the woman while she was pregnant or while she gave birth or after that. The cost you know, of bringing up the piccaninis, as they call them, who had a very high rate of infant mortality. So, you know, you spend all that money, you lose all the woman's labor, and then, you know, you have to feed them, and then they died. Okay? Uh, it's not worth it. So you discourage that. Uh, it made more sense to them economically to buy a young buck, you know, let's say, from Africa, work the hell out of them, much as you can get. And if they die, too bad, as long as you make a handsome profit. Because with the existence of a slave trade, you can always buy another one to replace them, okay? So the assumption was that this was more profitable. That was a clear calculation. Child rearing was discouraged, as several um, historians have um, strongly emphasized and pointed out. Um, slaves were malnourished. That was among the first to point out. Um, historians often like to emphasize the fact that Jamaicans, or to point out the fact that the Jamaican planters allow the slaves to feed themselves by, through their provision ground. But that was a mean strategy. I mean, you're not only exploiting people, it's the turning around and said, you go feed yourself. And then you have a half an acre up in the woods there you can use. Sadly, tragically, because of the psychology, the psychological terrors of slavery and the, uh, the, the, the slave actually went along with that because just having a moment in which you're determining your own destiny, going back to those five motives, right, in which you have some say in what you're doing, um, they, they fell for it, understandably, even though it meant 
in fact, that they were malnourished. And, um, and starvation was always on the brink. I mean, you have a bad hurricane and hundreds, sometimes thousands of slaves died. Um, now, this strategy worked as long as the slave trade is in existence, okay? Now, the, in the U.S., and let me emphasize, the U.S. were not paragons of virtue. They, uh, as I'll get to in a minute, they just found it economically more expedient, better, to rear their slaves for all sorts of reasons. There's more land there, the food was cheaper. There's a large white farming population which is producing food. And um, it um, benefited them, the strategy. Now, it's been shown that you still had a high rate of mortality among blacks, as Steckelt and others have demonstrated. But that two different strategies, OK? Um, with very different consequences. Now, I want to show you a video, which is based on and which is produced by the um, Atlantic Slave um, uh, Project. This is this wonderful organization which has um, transformed the study of slavery by uh, quantifying um, all the um, slaves who came over. We, we now know, uh, believe it or not, um, I, um, I find it hard to believe going back, as I think back on my days as a graduate student, that this is now possible, that uh, almost every ship that um, cross the Atlantic, the data has been collected. And, um, and they've developed a, um, a very nice video which illustrates um, the differences in comparing um, the two. Uh, there's an anima animated version, which I'm going to show you. Hope it works. Uh, it's a minute. Uh, now, the important thing to note about this animation is that this is not a simulation. This is based on real data. I'm going to take a look. You're going to see the stream of ships flowing from Africa with slaves to the Americas. Take a look at the numbers, the volume going to the Caribbean, and especially Jamaica, as opposed to going to America. Now remember, America is hundreds of times larger than um, Jamaica. So here we go. Go ahead, my friend. Here. Just look at that. We're starting about yeah, 1700. Um, these, every one of those dots is a ship, OK? Um, so they're going, look at where they're going, OK? Um, so we want to uh, pause. It's about, let's go up to about 1750. Um, the red. All right. OK, stop there. OK, I will just um, pinpoint for me a couple of those dots. The dots. Yeah. You see, um, what we have here is every one of these dots constitute a ship. Every one of these dots, sorry, thank you, please, uh, constitute a ship. And um, it, it, you can see the numbers where they're going. Can you enlarge this? It's going to get more. OK, continue up to about, uh, continue with the video. Yeah, OK. Um, and um, yeah. Now look, um, what is amazing is how many are going to the Caribbean. And in particular, I'm afraid the 1763 is blocking it out. The num yeah, great, great. Uh, that's fabulous. Thank you. Now just look at that. Look at the numbers going to Jamaica. Okay, stop. Stop it a minute for me. Okay? You see, I mean, this is just amazing. Um, could the, yeah, okay. Um, this, this video more than anything else, when I show it to my students, they are all sort of gasp in disbelief. Can I remember little Jamaica. Jamaica, you know, is uh, smaller than Connecticut. Um, and um, compared, most of those are going to the Caribbean, and a substantial number 
going to Jamaica. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, you can get this online, by the way. It's nice to play around with it. I urge you to do that, um, to be informed about this data. Oops. Um, okay. We move forward. Thanks. Um, um, so, let me just carry you through the actual data on which this is based. This is important. We need, we need those, this slide. Uh, okay, shall I go forward? All right, I'll go forward. Um, okay. All right. Um, Sir Hillary, you said referred to this earlier. Sir Hillary, usually I should have a mic. No, my name. Sir Hillary referred to this here, but I wanted to look at this graph. Don't get don't get too too intimidated by the graph. Some of you I know just don't like um, um, figures. Um, the blue the blue um, bars. Thank you. The blue. Can you hear me? The blue bars, okay, uh, oops, the blue bars are um, the U.S., uh, the red is Jamaica. The orange. <laughs> you guys are particular. You know what I mean. <laughs> the orange is Jamaica, okay? And the blue is the U.S. Just look at this. You don't even look at the figures. I'll show you the figures in a minute. But just take a look. This is serious. We're, going to, we're getting into the nitty-gritty here, okay? This little island is sort of taking that many more slaves than the whole continent of America. Isn't that incredible? Um, I sort of had a shout out here to um, Richard Dunn's recent study who compared on a micro level the, um, the uh, two countries, um, uh, Virginia and Jamaica. And um, the, as he pointed out uh, in a wonderful study, as disposable cogs in a machine, importing slaves from Africa, as is in Jamaica, working them too hard, feeding them too little, exposing them to debilitating disease, and routinely importing new Africans to replace those who died. That was Jamaica, as opposed to Virginia. Um, now, again, I'm not here to praise America because, as I said, there are very good self-interested reasons why they did that. But um, what I um, want to refer to, though, is that several historians have contested the argument um, uh, uh, that I'm making, and um, some of them very good historians, like Stanley Engelman and so on, which... Um, I want to take a comment because I want to leave you with imprinted on your minds the, the idea that we are genocide in Jamaica. So we want to get into um, the objections. <clears throat> One argument is that it's just because they were cruel and deliberately killing them off um, or using them so badly that they died off. But uh, the tropical environment and epidemiological factors prevented the reproduction strategy of the American slaveholders. That argument falls apart for several reasons. Um, Barbados was able to reproduce its slave population, same tropical environment. The disease environment in the US is not much better. Uh, and perhaps the best argument is that the slave, the ex-slave population started to increase almost immediately after slavery. Okay, so what happened to the 
and physical environment, it's the same physical environment, the same epidemiological, but they suddenly started to increase. The only difference is one was slavery, one was not. The, um, the other argument is that the US had a large farming sector and were better able to feed their slaves. Now, my response to that argument is very simple. Jamaica was an integral part of the US, of the North American system. As the historians have well demonstrated that, okay? We were buying a lot of our stuff from them. Barbados, for example, bought a lot of its um, supplies from the US. We were part of that triangular system, okay? Um, now, with, as I mentioned earlier, being 36.6 times more wealthy than the American whites meant that they could easily, easily buy the food they needed to feed the slaves properly. In other words, they could easily use the American strategy. They were much, much wealthier. And in fact, Barbados is doing that. The, so the, this is not an argument. I mean, again, um, you know, this argument falls apart. If they wanted to, they could, because they were so damn rich. They had so many results, they were earning so much from um, slavery that if they decided, well, you know, maybe we should sort of follow what the Americans are doing and feed our slaves a little better, uh, allow the women to reproduce a little more, uh, it might be in our long term interest to do so. I mean, they, they had that option, important though. They were 36 times richer than the Americans were doing that, so the option was open. Okay? Then there's this argument from, now Engerman is a friend of mine, I like him, uh, but he's, well, you know, you can be friends with someone with whom you have, to have profound differences, and he's an economist, um, I think he's now emeritus, an uh, economist, a very good economist, who's contributed a lot to the history of slavery. The argument here is that, no, the problem was women, African women's lactation practices. The argument is that African women and the African slaves in Jamaica, they breastfed the slaves too damn long. And um, they, um, uh, which is, you know, created um, all kinds of problems. Um, and including the fact that, um, you know, you, weren't, it would, you wouldn't reproduce as often. I think that argument is hogwash, complete hogwash. As a matter of fact, um, but it didn't hold for Barbados. Um, in fact, African lactation practices have been shown by several recent studies to, for a poor country to be actually a better strategy for the kid, the survival of the kid. Okay, because yeah, in, inside the womb, the kid still has a chance to eat, to, 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 so, so, you know, to be suckered and so on. And, um, the feeding from, uh, not just inside the womb, but feeding, breastfeeding was a better strategy for survival than anything, um, you know, depending on food from the owner and so on. So that argument just doesn't work. Um, an important point to note is that in Jamaica, the mass rape of women, and that's something which cannot be overemphasized. For a long time, the study of slavery in Jamaica just neglected this fact. I made it absolutely clear in my study of slavery way back. But um, American scholars have now emphasized slavery as a form of sexual slavery. Um, but the mass rape of whites, by whites, of um, women led to um, chronic venereal diseases. That comes out clearly in, in documents, recent documents. Um, on the sex life of um, the, the owner, owner class, the slaveholder class. Um, so um, Thistlewood in particular, who documented all his sexual exploits down in Westmoreland. Um, uh, it's clear. Uh, so, uh, Douglas Hall has estimated that Within three months of coming to Jamaica, almost all African women um, had some kind of venereal disease. Okay? And we know that venereal disease is, is sort of very negatively related to fertility. Okay? So, 
So now, okay, so let's get to the bottom line. Okay? What I take from all this, and thanks for your patience, but I, you're not used to getting academic lectures, and you know, I, would, <laughs> I like to give inspiring lectures sometimes, especially to a broad out audience, but I'm not going to, you know, I assume that you, this is something you're profoundly interested in and want to know the facts. And I'm making a very, very strong case here, okay? And I want you to leave with a certain idea, which is that we had genocide in Jamaica. Now, just look at, these are the um, actual figures coming from what I just showed you earlier. So, as Sir Hillary pointed out, between 1650 and 1830, 1.07 million Africans were taken to Jamaica. During the same period, 388,233 were taken to North America. You remember how small Jamaica is? Remember how big America is, okay? And big not just in the sense of um, the size of the problem, but the number of plantations and so on. In 1830, however, there were 2,009048 enslaved people of African ancestry in America. And if you include freed black people, a total of 2.3 million black people in America in 2018. I'll just compare those two. Begin to see where I'm going. Huh? At the same time, there are only 319,070 enslaved, and a total, taking account of the free colored, um, of 357,000. 147 black people in Jamaica. What happened to them? What happened to them? You get my point? Had Africans, here's the bottom line, had Africans and their descendants in Jamaica experienced the same, quite modest, by the way, as the economic historian for Stanford, um, Stecker, has pointed out. It wasn't all that great. It was quite modest. There's a high mortality and so on. So it's a very modest rate of reproduction in America. Enough, though, to, for the population to grow. Had they experienced the same modest rate? This is a counterfactual strategy I'm using. To use fancy causal language. Um, the 18... In eight, the 1830 black population of Jamaica would have been 5.2 million. And including freed colored, it should have been six, a little over six million. That's a simple counterfactual argument I'm using there, okay? I'm saying simply, had Jamaica the same reproduction rate as the very modest, very modest rate that Americans showed was possible, and which they could well afford given their wealth, the total population in Jamaica should have been 5.2 million black people, and we take into account of the coloreds, 6 million. Instead, you had 359,000 survivors in 1830. And so using the U.S. as a counterfactual, we find that there were 5,731,000 missing black people. This is it. This is the bottom line. I'm quantifying the amount of genocide in Jamaica. This is it. This is the figure. This is the one I want you to write down, sip in your head. 5,731,302 people, black people, were not in Jamaica who should have been there. And you, you, this will take you back to the arguments I was raising earlier about genocide and so on. Okay, this is, you understand now what I was building up to. And the whole debate about intent and so on. You're taking all that into account. This is it. This is it. This is the measure of physical genocide. Note it's almost six million, 
which is about the, the number of Jews who were killed in Nazi Germany. Now, there are important differences between the Jewish Holocaust and, um, and the Black Holocaust, and let's call it that in Jamaica. Okay? The temporal factor. The Jewish social death lasted 12 years between 1933 and 1945, while that of Jamaica was 183 years. We're talking about from 16. Uh, 55 to 1830. The Jewish physical destruction concentrated over a period of four years, okay, while Jamaicans lasted for 183 years. And there's the nature of the elimination. With Jews' actual living bodies destroyed, with Jamaicans, well, apart from the Murders and shortened lives, potential lives, were preventively eliminated, although they were preventively eliminated through the maltreatment and so on, treatment of women and what have you. But that's an important point to work. I call it protracted genocide, um, as opposed to the Jewish genocide. Okay, that is my main argument. I want you to think about it, and I'm happy to discuss it with you. Before I go on to the question of consequences. Don't have much time, but I'll pause, because I see someone is very interested in asking a question. Because we're making big claims here. Go ahead. Okay, I'm here in Jamaica for only for a few more days left, and I'm here primarily to link in, hopefully, with Professor Beckles and others, so that we may better use the large sum of money that the Archbishop of Canterbury has laid aside a month ago for the rehabilitation and benefit of all those who the Church of England, the Anglican Church, which I might add was the major slaving country in the Caribbean, yeah. for, for its benefit. Yes, sir. My question is, your topic is very interesting, the past. And whilst I've been in this, my mission of trying to link Jamaica with what I'm doing in England, I was incredibly struck when I asked the Gleaner for their assistance, and I described myself as one of His Majesty's African Caribbean heritage subject, to which the senior editor stopped me and said, Jamaican people describe themselves as Jamaican. Yeah, okay. And so my question to you is that, um, how have we lost, you, this is talking about the past and the past, how have we lost, how has Jamaicans lost their ancestral link yeah. to Africa? Yeah. Okay, can I get back to it at the end of um, the talk? Because I want to very quickly wrap up. Okay? Um, uh, because of time, um, I, um, I want to um, draw your attention to an important um, set of issues related to all this. What does it mean? What does genocide mean? What are its consequences for Jamaica afterwards? This is what we're profoundly interested in. The Prime Minister, the present Prime Minister, uh, you know, in his um, uh, Emancipation Day um, speech a couple of years ago, uh, referring to the upsurge of violence and so on, directly linked um, or history of violence, um, the 133 years of violence to um, the presence of, um, during slavery with violence today. Question is, how do we make the link? It's a fascinating question, okay? Uh, it's also, of course, related to the issue of reparations. 
Um, the um, reparations, of course, don't depend on the legacies of um, slavery in a way, because um, the, the, just the existence of that near six million genocide um, is enough. You don't have to prove that there were consequences today to make the case for reparations, even if we were a rich society today. I mean, in the case of Jew, Jewish Americans are very well off in America uh, and in Europe. Um, they, um, they, 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 they still sort of strongly, of course, advocate for and make the case for um, uh, the reparations. Um, but I think it's important for us, given what we're going through in Jamaica today, to ask what is the connection? Because so often, especially among upper class and more conservative Jamaicans, we hear, look, isn't it time you forget about this? You know, let's move, let's move on, let's move on. We've, it's, it's, it's 100. We've spent 133 years in slavery, and it's been 135 years now, so it's time to move on. No, it's not time to move on if we're still living with the consequences. And um, while I won't have the time to go through all of this with you, um, I just want to um, I just want to say that I've been my most recent work involves looking at what's emerged as a major new development in recent years in the study of slavery, namely the legacy of slavery school. For a long time, I was a lonely voice sort of emphasizing this, but it's become a hot topic. Uh, among economists, economic historians, and historians, and a few sociologists. And um, the, the basic problem is, how do you do it? It seems obvious that the violence today may be related, but how do you prove it? And that's been one of the really radical developments in scholarship in recent years. And um, I don't, uh, <laughs> this is just a list of the best. The, these are just a list of the best recent studies which have um, taken up the challenge of how you make the link between what happened you know, in 1865, up to 1865 and what goes on today. And it's quite remarkable. Um, this is just some of the, um, the um, works um, which have been um, done by some of the leading um, economists. Um, uh, let me just... On your, through a couple of them. Uh, one is a clear, can I have that, yeah. A clear um, relationship has been shown between slavery and economic development. We're talking now about some of the best historians. Started with Engelman, the same Engelman I mentioned earlier. Um, but my favorite recent um, work um, is, is that by um, the MIT economist, Daron Ajemoglu, who joined this um, group, which is quite amazing, uh, since he's one of the best economists in America today. He sort of won the Clark Prize as the best economist on the 40s and designed for a Nobel laureate, and um, considered one of the best. So I was very happy to see that he got in to this guy, he's also an economic historian. And now what he, the strategy he used is a strategy which almost all scholars uh, working in this area have done. And that is, they take advantage of variation, variation within a particular society of the intensity of slavery, one area and then the other. So you just look at how intense the plantation system is in one area and how um, it merges in the other, and how it correlates with. And then they used very elaborate regression models, um, with highly robust, um, to indicate what the link is. So Ajemoglu's paper looked at Colombia. And the opportunity there was a fascinating variation. That is, we know there's slavery in, in Colombia, but almost all the slavery was in one particular the gold mining region. Okay, whereas the rest of Colombia had free labor. So you could then look at what are the situation in Colombia today in the gold mining region and the non-gold mining. But it's more than just a correlation. They were able to sort of uh, use various robust 
effectiveness um, estimates to indicate whether it's due to modern structural factors or not. And the result is clear. Having slavery had devastating long-term current consequences in terms of the degree of inequality in the society, in terms of the degree of education in the society, in terms of the degree of racism in the society. That, this, this, for me, is the model. If you read one work, look at that. And I like it as a fact that it's, um, it's on a, 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 a new world outside, outside of the US. Now, most of the studies have been done on the US. And they indicate just an extraordinary range of consequences, uh, not just levels of inequality and poverty, but it's been shown, again, by two wonderful uh, political scientists, that you can predict the level of conservatism and anti-black sentiment in the South, just con restricting yourself to the South, uh, by the intensity of the plantation system in different parts of the South. You can always predict who's going to vote for Trump by knowing the, 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 the intensity of slavery in different parts of the South. Uh, it's been shown that the arrest rate of blacks uh, is closely related. It's been shown that violence, and here we get to Jamaica, violence in America is very, very closely related to the experience of slavery, both among whites and blacks. Okay, the execution rate has been shown. The degree of mobility, um, the degree of colorism. Well, we know that, um, and uh, and so on. But the ones I want to draw attention to is the work on violence. There have been several of them, um, and um, hate crimes. There is another one. I will end with this because this. Each topic, each one of these, um, each of these refers to a cluster of studies. What I want to um, draw attention to, finally, is studies of trust. Trust. It's been found, and this is based mainly on studies, not just in America, but in Africa and in Brazil. Again, dealing with some of the sharpest young minds, Nathan Nunn, brilliant young economist at Harvard, um, and has looked at um, how um, slavery and the degree of slave raiding influenced the degree of trust in parts of Africa. And you can map almost the degree of slave trading and the degree of trust with the degree of development and persisting trust and corruption and lack of sort of uh, faith in government. And similarly in Brazil and similarly in the United States. It's not by accident that black Americans have the lowest level of trust in the United States. And that cuts across income groups. So what I'm getting at, it, well, the problem we have with Jamaica, and I learned too, <laughs> um, is we don't have the same degree of variation. That's the problem. The problem with Jamaica is the whole island is just one big plantation, right? So you don't get the variation which you get in the US or Brazil or Colombia. In Colombia, you know, slavery was over there. Slavery wasn't there. Let's see what happens now as opposed to what happened then. Um, there are one or two I've been toying around with. One, and <laughs> this is a correlation, so please don't. There is one area, there are two areas of Jamaica which had low levels of slavery, a higher proportion of the population which were um, free. Portland, and Trelawney and St. Elizabeth. You know who were there? The Maroons. Okay, go and look at a map and see what the level of violence is in Jamaica today. It's lowest, in, in fact, it's lowest in Portland, in Trelawney and St. Elizabeth. No, this is just a, no proof, this is just a correlation. But it almost blew my mind when I looked at the figures for uh, murder, and today see that it was zero in Portland. And uh, wow, but this doesn't prove anything. It's a, but it's a very suggestive. 
correlation. If only we had more variation of the same sort, I have no doubt we'd end up with the same kind of results. In other words, that slavery profoundly influenced the degree of violence that emerged. In the slavery was violence, violence. Violence against the slave, which the slaves themselves adopted among themselves, between men and women, for parents and children. In fact, there's one study which shows a clear relationship between child rearing patterns and slavery in, uh, in the South. Uh, slavery and education, again, it's there. So I am fairly comfortable in extrapolating from the studies of where variation permits one to draw these fairly sophisticated conclusions in Colombia, in Brazil, uh, in Africa, and in the US South. I'm fairly comfortable extrapolating from that to include that our level of violence, our level of mistrust, uh, and our level of um, our education problems um, and, um, are all intimately linked to the genocide that we experienced for 133 years. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it takes so long. I tend to go on very long when I speak in the Jamaica, but that's because I don't see you enough, so I, <laughs> I try to make up. <laughs> I am open to questions. Uh, if anyone um, are interested, yes, yes, please. Uh, can we, um, yes, sir, round the back. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Wait, am I? Yeah, okay. Go ahead, sir. Okay, sorry, I'm going. So thank you for a very stimulating lecture, Professor Patterson. Uh, so you've left us on, a, on a, a very low note. And I want to perhaps ask you, this I'm no doubt would be the subject of another lecture, but thinking about your, your book of essays, the Jamaica, the Confounding Island, you give us some hints by, for example, your comparisons between Jamaica and Barbados and so on, and the, the, the lack of, or the, the relatively low development of institutions in Jamaica. Uh, I wanted to ask you then, if you're to project from this, this lecture that you've given us today, to help us to think about the nature of the society we have at present, not just the violence, but in terms of the ways in which we as ordinary Jamaicans can contribute to building something else. Reparations is one thing, but we can't wait on that boat. There are things that I presume that we can do ourselves, and I, I, no doubt your education report and so on is, is yeah. helping us to, to move in that direction. But are there, that, that, that is a report primarily to the state, to, to the Jamaican government. What, what would you say to us as Jamaican citizens in terms of building levels of trust, in terms of building institutional capacity and so on, yeah. given this history? Yeah. The, the two are not incom incompatible. Reparation, um, you know, the demand for reparation and recognition of that horror. And I think making the case for geno gen genocide um, strengthens the argument, although, as I said, uh, you know, it, the argument was already quite powerful. But we, um, so, um, yeah, well, um, many of the um, factors I emphasize in, this, uh, in these studies um, would suggest the kind of things we have to um, focus on. 
uh, our biggest problem is the problem of violence. And the violence that is expressed not just in terms of killings, uh, but in terms of in relationships, in terms of um, male-female relationships in particular. Um, the fact that, you know, we're not only, I think I made this point when I gave my last big talk here um, in reference to the book, but it's a pretty disturbing one, um, uh, which gets me depressed every time I think about it, is that we not only have one of the highest rates of um, violence reflected in homicide rates, but we have the, the highest rate of femicide in the world, the murder of women. And, um, uh, and that, I have no doubt that that goes deep into our past, okay? Um, and, um, and we know from the um, work on slavery that there is a great deal of tension, um, gender tension, um, on the plantation, but we know it persisted. Um, we know that a level of distrust exists. One way in which it's transmitted, and when we're getting to um, what can be done, we ask what are the mechanisms of transmission? Um, the, um, the, on the broader structural level, is no doubt that the degree of inequality in the society is an important one. Um, the, um, um, and reducing the level of um, inequality. It's giving people more options in their lives is important. But at the interpersonal level, um, there's no doubt that we have to do something about how we raise our children. We have to get rid of the use of violence in the raising of children. Um, the, um, the, the education system is, for me, the main um, way in which we can tackle many of these problems. And I, when I was asked to deliver this talk, I really spent several days actually agonizing between whether I should speak about the work I've been doing on education. And I've spent most of the last two and a half, three years of my life working on education in Jamaica. I dropped, when I was asked by the PM to chair this um, commission, I dropped everything including these studies here about slavery, to work on this. And I have no doubt that um, this is the way to go. Um, there is no doubt now uh, among students of development, of students of um, you know, crime and violence, you know, that education is a critical factor. As many of you know, in 1962, when we started the race to development, a little country about our own size called Singapore had the same per capita income as we did. No, Singapore has a higher per capita income in PPP dollars than America. What is the difference? Education. Okay? If you look at it, no doubt about that. Um, our education system has not served us well. Now the tragedy there, and I don't want to go off into my other main thing, but you know the sad thing about that? It's not that our leaders have not paid attention to education. Because as I emphasize in my report, if you look at the percentage of GDP, or the percentage of the national budget spent on education. Jamaica is among the top 20% of countries. Okay? And the other interesting thing about Jamaica, and I say that not just because the former uh, longest serving prime minister is here, is that the coordination between the different parties have been stronger in Jamaica than almost anywhere else in the Americas. In the Americas, when you have a, <laughs> a situation in which you know, as soon as one government comes in, they scrap every plan that the previous government had on education and try to start over. That's what goes on in Mexico and a few other places. We've had remarkable continuity in the commitment of our leaders to education. Okay? And, um, and um, so, why has it not worked? 
we have to get down to what goes on at the institutional level and in the schools. We have to go back to what we inherited in terms of the system of education uh, the, the British left us. Um, I'm not through yet. I'm on phase two of the commission, which is looking at technical, TVET, technical and vocational training. And I want to just give you a little advance that one of the most radical proposals we have is the need to move towards the more Danish, German, um, New Zealand model in which technical and vocational education becomes an integral part of the broader educational system. So um, we, have to, we, have to, we have to think seriously. Unfortunately, and I don't want to, no, I better not say what I um, want to say. Um, I want to express the hope that, you know, I spent uh, almost two years of my life with some very smart people from this institution and from outside, stakeholders, who work hard. And we produced a report of over 350 pages. Um, and um, we're waiting to see what happens. <laughs> I'm hopeful. I'm an optimist. But to answer your question, sir, education is the key. And education involves reforming not just the, the structure, the ministry itself, organizationally. It involves what we, what we teach, how we teach. It involves moving, making an important part of our um, uh, uh, of curriculum, not just return to reemphasizing history again, which we, I agree with several people here that um, we neglect, but neglected, but more importantly, emphasizing social and emotional learning as an important component. If it's not happening in the family, we have to, it has to happen somewhere. But um, uh, there are many other ways in which uh, we can go. But we see education as key to solve not just the economic problems, since the evidence is now uh, overwhelming that the path to the development goes through having a good, educa efficient education system, but also the path to reducing violence goes through to how we teach our people. Look, let me, you, you've seen, the Gleaner has been very good in uh, emphasizing that. But you know, you want to know the source of violence, you want to know one of the mechanisms by which it's continuing. Over half of the kids who come out of our primary schools can't read and write. What can they do? Okay, when you drop out, what do you do? Turn to violence. I mean, the, 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 the links are so clear, it's, it, it's obvious. You don't have to, but it's, it's very sad. So, simple answer, there are others, but you know, changing our, our gender attitudes is going to be very important. And you know, I know people are working on that, but how we view women, how we view relationships, and um, our education system, making it more efficient, integrating technical and vocational training. And um, I, hope, I hope we move in that direction. And as I said, it's not for want of money. Um, it's for want of the will and for getting away from what we inherited. Um, I know, for example, that there's going to, all hell is going to break loose when we suggest they used to be teaching technical vocational training in Campion. But anyway. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I, have, I, have no, I have no right to say that. And uh, I'm sure I'm completely wrong. Yes, sir. Um, evening, Professor. Thank you for a great lecture. Um, just wondered if in your studies or the work you've done, you've ever seen any connection with the names that we hold from slavery. So here in Jamaica, some of the most violent um, communities are called pens, something pen, Sly Pen, Grants Pen. And where would you stand on government policy changing some of the names of communities or names associated with our slavery past? Well, while the leader... <laughs> What? One, of the leading, one of the leading students, or the leading student with the study of pens, is here in the audience, maybe better qualified to sort of respond to that. I, 
the names are important, but many of us have slave names, you know. Um, and um, we're named after Roman emperors and so on. My first name is... <laughs> no, 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 my first name is, is Horace. And Horace is an old Roman name from the Roman poets, you know. And um, so, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe um, it, it might help, but um, I doubt it. Uh, a lot of the pens have now become towns. You know, I spent quite a few years in my teenage days in Jones Pen. When it was Jones Pen, it's now Jonestown. So maybe. Um, did I? Okay. Thank you very much. of the Nettleford Foundation to come forward as we collectively make this presentation and we will ask our sponsor to join us. Um, is Mr. Richard Hall the painter in the audience? Well, I, I should share with you that um, when, he, when he heard of this opportunity, he said if he couldn't be here, he would ask us to say what an honor it is for him to have been the painter for this presentation we were about to make uh, to Professor Orlando Patterson. Um, uh, we will package it and send it to him, his home in Boston.
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and the others can stop talking. <laughs> Thank you very much. What a tour de force. What a tour de force. The past has not passed the heritage of slavery and genocide in Jamaica. Case listed, case made, judgment for the plaintiff. I want to thank Professor the Honorable Orlando Patterson, our distinguished presenter, a son of West Milan, so a neighbor of the Honorable P.J. Patterson. We are very proud of him. He has conquered academic heights by remaining grounded in the unerring relevance of history and sociology. Thank you very much, sir. And of course, a vote of thanks would not be complete without thanking our function chairman, the most honorable P.J. Patterson, former prime minister, <laughs> co-chair of the Rex Littleford Foundation, our elder statesman, an advocate of the South, and the guiding hand of the Foundation. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Vice Chancellor Sir Hilary Beckles, who showed dexterity and wisdom. First of all, like, unlike others, he made sure to recognize she who must be obeyed. <laughs> Enough brownie points right there. But we thank him not only for introducing our distinguished presenter, but for so ably, as he always does, representing our university, a real part of the Caribbean conscience. And we thank you very much, sir. I have always favored Septimus over Bob. And the historic grounding that you have now been given, I think we can thank you, not only for so ably representing the title sponsor, but so eloquently speaking to the expanse of the contribution of the person that we honor. Thank you very much, and thank you for the check. I don't know if Kerry Ann left or if she's with us, Miss Kerry Ann Henry. Ballet mistress and one of the principal dancers for representing the NDTC so well in that moving solo. Incidentally, it's an excerpt from Katrina, choreographed by Rex Nettleford in 2006. So thank you very much, Terry Ann. And the Rex Nettleford Foundation as keeper of the flame. I want to thank the board of directors. The foundation was really our host for the evening and it's co-led by Sir Shridas Ramphal, and you saw members of the foundation. Thank you very much. I also want to separately thank the University of the West Indies, the National Dance Theatre Company, and those are two institutions to which Prof dedicated so much of his time, energy, and vision. We want to thank them for helping us to mark the day and to add some luster to the distinguished lecture. The Institutional Advancement Division of the UWI, led by Mrs. Elizabeth Buchanan Hind, as Executive Director for its tremendous logistical organizational support. Thank you very much. We thank the members of the media for coming and marking the occasion, recording it and reporting on it. But we also want to thank you profoundly. You know, a lecture is not a lecture if there's no one there to hear it. And a lecture is not a lecture if there's no one there to learn 
from it. A case was made, and Prof kept on emphasizing that if you will leave with nothing, leave with this. And we hope that you not only enjoyed the lecture, but that you learned from it. This is an academic institution. And part of his life's work, the spirit whom we honor today, was enlightening others and giving us a sense of self. And I don't think it is a coincidence, if you will forgive me, just one personal reflection in a vote of thanks that you have Orlando Patterson, P.J. Patterson, Hillary Beckles as your opening speakers, people who understand that an understanding of self is the beginning of so much. So we thank you, gentlemen. And that is the end of the vote of thanks. You will forgive me one shameless commercial break. <laughs> I repeat. Remembering Rex, a performance of the National Dance Theatre Company and the University Singers in tribute to Rex, is on Wednesday, February 8, 2023, at 7 p.m. at the Little Theatre. I see the Artistic Director for the NDTC, Mr. Marlon Sims, in the audience, and I see several of the directors. They will be happy to guide you to where you can get tickets. <laughs> a mere 3,000 contribution. Ever the guiding hand, Mr. Patterson says downstairs, <laughs> don't leave without the ticket. <laughs> well, I was getting to the refreshments, sir. <laughs> but I do want the tickets before the refreshments. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, ladies and gentlemen, refreshments downstairs. Thank you very much.